Good afternoon and uh, welcome to NUPI and today's seminar, Maritime Security in East Asia, Summer of Our Discontent, featuring NUPI's own Mark Lantain. My name is Renyani Lindgren and I am a research fellow here at NUPI, also working on issues related to East Asia, uh, and I will be acting as the chair today. Before we get started, I thought to say a couple words about today's seminar. It is in fact part of two of NUPI's ongoing seminar series on Asia. The first is the Modern Asia Seminar Series, and the second is a newer edition that I hope many of you have already attended on China and the Nordics. Uh, and this seminar series will be running out for the, the next year or so uh, on China and the Nordics, and both of these are run under NUPI's Europe Asia Research Center. Um, I should mention that we also have an upcoming seminar next week on China and the Nordics. Actually, we will be inviting colleagues from Copenhagen and also from Helsinki to join us on this seminar. And it is also part of the launching of the upcoming, upcoming issue of um, International Politik, NUPI's academic publication. And this issue will be focused on Asia. It will be coming out in just a few days, September 15th. Uh, and it's open access now, which means all the articles are free for you online. So please do your reading beforehand if you'd like. Um, we will have uh, a couple of speakers, like I said, from Finnmark and Denmark, Finland and Denmark, and we will also have an, uh, an article on there on Sino-Japanese relations in the East China Sea, very much related to today's seminar. Um, today's seminar will run for about 40 minutes, and it will begin with a presentation from Dr. Lantain, and then we will open the floor for questions. Um, I should warn you all that it, you are being streamed, you are on YouTube right now, and you will be throughout the seminar, but also please use this as an opportunity to tell other friends to tune in eventually, uh, and, and those who cannot make it can hopefully check later on on our seminar webpage. Uh, I won't go into too many details about the background for today's seminar because I know Mark uh, is a specialist in this area and he has a lot to say. Uh, so I would just like to briefly introduce him. Uh, as you know, Mark is a researcher here at NUPI. He's a senior fellow. His research interests include China and East Asia, foreign policy, China's engagement and cooperation with regional and international organizations, Sino-European relations and trade politics, and China's commercial diplomacy. He is the author of China and International Institutions, Alternative Paths to Global Power, and Chinese Foreign Policy and Introduction. And I should let you know that the most recent edition of that book came out earlier this year with a really nice cover photo, so you can see it out in the lobby afterwards. He has also written um, chapters and articles on subjects which include China's Asian diplomacy, China's regional engagement in Europe, and China's evolving strategy to strategic policies, including maritime security, free trade, uh, non-traditional security and economic affairs. And without introducing Mark, with, without mentioning the Arctic would be wrong because Mark is one of the leading experts also on the Arctic, especially um, developing Chinese policies in the Arctic. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to introduce Mark. At the end of Mark's speech again, I will uh, come up and invite the audience to participate in a question and answer session. And I should also mention there's some briefs in the back of the room based on the seminar series, and there will be another brief coming out of this seminar to look forward to as well. Mark, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Okay, well, first of all, um, hopefully everyone can hear me. Uh, thank you very much for coming this afternoon. Um, very happy to be here. What I'd like to talk a little about is primarily some of the events which have taken place in East Asia in the area of maritime security over the past um, few months. Needless to say, this past summer has been a very interesting period for those of you looking at East Asian security. Um, quite a bit of this interest has focused around specifically um, the issues surrounding the South China Sea. This is going to be the uh, bulk of my presentation. However, obviously there are other uh, very important issues, the East China Sea, as well as, as we saw just over the past few days, the uh, latest North Korean nuclear test. I'd be very happy to discuss those during the questions as well. But the prime focus I wanted to talk about is uh, how the South China Sea uh, policy and the diplomatic and strategic disputes have evolved over the past few months. Um, this is an area of regional interest, but of course this is also an area of international interest, considering the sheer amount of economic, strategic, and political importance this part of the world has. Now, the main 
uh, event, if you want to call it that, which has put the South China Sea, which is never very far away from the news, uh, back into the headlines, was the long-awaited ruling by the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague regarding a court case brought by the government to the Philippines uh, against the government of China in January of 2013. What this ruling uh, represents, and certainly when this issue came up, a lot of us, including myself, had to look through quite a bit of legal, uh, legal material, but essentially what this meant was the Philippine government was uh, interested in the clarification of the legal status of the waters of the South China Sea, especially those areas that have been disputed between China and the Philippines uh, over the past few years. More specifically, the Philippines government was arguing that China's maintaining of the so-called Nine Dash Line in the South China Sea did not have a very strong legal basis, and more to the point that the existence of the line uh, clashed directly with the Philippines' own exclusive economic zone, and I'll get back to both points very shortly. Now, once the court case was brought forward, the government of China declined to participate in, the pro uh, in this process, arguing that the permanent court was out of its jurisdiction, that the Philippines itself was acting uh, in bad faith, and that Beijing has argued that the best way of settling this dispute uh, is through bilateral negotiations, as opposed to internationalizing uh, the issue. Beijing also cited the Philippines for going outside of what it saw was the 2002 Declaration of Conduct of the Parties in the South China Sea. This was an agreement which was struck in 2002, otherwise known as the DOC, between China and the uh, governments of ASEAN. So China was very, the Chinese government was obviously very unhappy with what it saw was an attempt to unjustifiably um, internationalize the conflict. Beijing has also argued that this kind of court procedure should not be used either as a blunt instrument or uh, should be used to deny any country its historical waters or its historical right to sovereign territory, according to the Chinese government. So despite protests and non-participation by Beijing, the first major uh, ruling took place in October of last year. The permanent court said that there was enough evidence to go forward with some of the Philippines' um, specific requests. These included uh, core arguments over the status of the so-called disputed features in the South China Sea, and I'll be getting back to specifics very shortly. Whether particular features, uh, reefs, islets, depending on your legal definition, were capable of generating the so-called 200 uh, nautical mile exclusive economic zone. The answer to this was very key to various sovereignty claims uh, that were being put forward by various parties. At the same time, the Philippines was also interested in getting a ruling about the status of its fishing vessels, um, the claim being from Manila that they were being unlawfully prevented from operating in parts of the disputed areas, and that Chinese vessels operating in the region were a hazard to the local environment. So these were some of the issues that the permanent court felt it did have a mandate to go forward with. So that was the situation in October. Now, Beijing continued to reject these claims, arguing that the PCA, the permanent court, was acting, again, outside of its jurisdiction, noting that the South China Sea had been historical waters for many, many centuries, and that Chinese activities within the Nine Dash Line uh, were completely legal and completely justifiable. So this is not a question of any party rejecting international law or rejecting maritime law. However, there was a very serious dispute over interpretation. Moreover, according to the Chinese government, this court was confusing the question of South China Sea exploitation rights, which is certainly within um, the mandate of the court, with sovereignty. The sovereignty of the South China Sea, the sovereignty of all of the features within the South China Sea. According to Beijing, the court was way outside of its bounds on that. So China continued to be a non-participant in this process. So this is why the final ruling, which, as I'm going to be explaining shortly, very much did not go in China's favor, was considered an area of significant concern, not only for China and the Philippines, but by several other parties. Now, to go into the origins of the dispute, uh, this would require probably about two or three more hours than we have here, so I'm not going to be going into a lot of the history. However, there's been a lot of very good material written on the subject very recently. Colleagues of mine, Bill Hayton, Ian Story, strongly recommend their recent work if you're looking to uh, get really good background material 
on how this dispute has uh, evolved. But the origins of the dispute, as I said at the beginning, are basically down to the question of sovereignty and jurisdiction. Now, this has been an issue for decades, but has intensified in difficulty in recent years. Why is the South China Sea, so I'll point this out here, why is this particular area of great importance? Well, long story short, geographically it is very important. In terms of its potential resources, it is quite important. Uh, it is said to be holding a considerable amount of oil and gas deposits. But at the same time, as you might imagine, this is a primary shipping route. Like basically anything coming from the Middle East or Africa or South Asia or further will pass through this waterway on the way to China, Japan, Korea, and so forth. About five trillion American worth of trade goes through this particular waterway every year. So it's not a surprise that many of the parties that are interested in the status of the South China Sea are especially concerned about freedom of navigation. Now, the Chinese government has maintained that the area within the nine dash lines, you can see the dashes here, um, designate China's sovereign waters. Now, the first official Chinese map, and I can give you, hopefully, there it is, okay. Now, the first official Chinese map that specifically indicated the Nine Dash Line came out in 1947, but this map was based on earlier maps uh, that were circulating in the 1930s. However, the actual claim to sovereignty goes much, much further back. Uh, the government of China has argued that historical evidence has suggested that these waters were under various forms of Chinese jurisdiction considerably before that. Now, originally, this particular line did not have nine dashes. It actually had 11. In 1953, two of the dashes were very quietly removed from official Chinese maps. This was out of solidarity to North Vietnam. Since that time, the map has changed again. I'll just go back. Yeah, OK. The map changed again in 2013. This map uh, began to circulate uh, in 2013 and afterwards. And I have a copy of it in my office, surrounded by a lot of junk, but it is there. And you'll notice, if you count the dashes, that a tenth one was added on this map uh, to reflect Taiwan. And the map also suggests an almost unbroken uh, kind of area of Chinese waters leading from the East China Sea to the South China Sea. So this was definitely considered a change in kind of viewpoint. Now. These so-called vertical maps are now very much standard. You can find them uh, at many Chinese bookstores and government offices now. So in addition to China's uh, particular area of, whoops, going too fast. OK. Now, in addition to the nine dash line, so represented by uh, this red line here, a few other countries, as you can see on the map, also claim some or all of the South China Sea but more importantly, some very, very specific groups of islets and reefs. Now, the three that have been getting the most attention, first of all, you have the Spratlys, certainly the largest of the groups. You have the Paracels here. You have the Scarborough Shoal. Oops, down here. Now, you can see by the colored lines the other various maritime claims that have been put forward by other uh, littoral states in the South China Sea. So the blue represents Vietnam. The purple represents the Philippines. You have Malaysia and Brunei down here. And as you can see, some of the claims overlap some of the islands um, and various reefs. The, an additional uh, area of dispute has been this little dot here, Natuna Island, which is uh, not under dispute. But China does have a dispute with Indonesia over the waters near Natuna Island. So put all that together, and you do have a uh, very difficult, for any of you who are looking at maritime law, you have a very difficult situation to deal with. Now, there have been incidents of direct conflict over some of the features in the South China Sea, including in January uh, 1974, there was a brief skirmish between China and South Vietnam over the Paracel Islands. Since that time, the Paracels have been uh, placed under Chinese sovereignty. It was also a diplomatic incident between China and the Philippines over the very ironically named Mischief Reef um, in 1995, when China began building various structures uh, on that particular area. There was, however, a very long cooling off period when 
at the turn of the century, so the late 90s, early 2000s, there was a lot of concern that this very delicate issue might escalate into greater violence. But in 2002, the Declaration of Conduct uh, in the South China Sea was signed in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, and it specifically called for peaceful negotiation. It called for all parties to avoid any provocative moves in the region and promised the idea of joint exploration for resources, the, uh, the oil and the gas. So the DOC, the Declaration of Conduct, did bring a temporary halt for about a decade to what was turning into a very uh, potentially dangerous situation. However, confidence between China and ASEAN began to erode during this period for a variety of reasons. The ASEAN states, especially the Philippines and Vietnam, which as you can see are the major uh, claimants here, uh, began to be concerned about China's naval expansion over the past decade. The introduction of the aircraft carrier, the consolidation of the Chinese Coast Guard, and what it saw as a cabbage strategy of China attempting to kind of ring or develop particular disputed areas with both civilian and, on occasion, military vessels. Beijing was getting increasingly unhappy as well. It saw a pattern of unregulated fishing in the South China Sea. Uh, it saw a lot of concern about whether its own uh, sovereign claims were being eroded. And there have been uh, also incidents of foreign firms uh, being invited into the region, uh, again in disputed zones. And China, again, getting concerned that the economic value uh, of the South China Sea was being uh, taken up by other countries outside of uh, what China saw as its jurisdiction. There were incidents in 2011. There were examples of cable cutting. Uh, three Chinese vessels were accused of cutting the exploration cable of a survey vessel belonging to Petro Vietnam. So incidents like this began to become more common after about 2010. Then 2014, there was the now infamous oil rig incident when a Chinese oil rig was towed into one of the disputed zones by a Chinese petroleum firm. It was there temporarily. After that, you also have the role of the United States. The introduction of the pivot policy after 2011, or more commonly known now as the rebalancing, further heightened Chinese concerns that a sort of de facto containment policy was in the works. Considering that the United States was improving security relations with Japan, with the Philippines, treaty partners, improving relations with Singapore, with Vietnam, China, the government of China has, for a very long time, been traditionally concerned about so-called neo-containment or any kind of steps taken by the United States and its friends and allies to limit uh, Chinese power in the region. So once the pivot uh, went underway, these anxieties were very much heightened. Now, another issue here, before I go too much further, this is a kind of close-up of the Spratleys. Now, you can see by some of the little dots here that uh, quite a few of the countries involved have set up various, um, various claims and various um, levels of presence in some of the Spratly Islands. Now, we're talking about very tiny features. We're talking about uh, islets or reefs, some of them barely the size of this room, many of which are not able to, at least independently, support any, uh, any habitation. But these are still considered very important for any legal claims to the surrounding area. So the red dots indicate uh, areas that are occupied by China. So you have the Philippines, you have Malaysia. I do call your attention, because I'll be getting back to this, this small little blue dot here. That represents Itu Aba, which is a feature occupied by Taiwan. And I will be getting back to that, because that figures quite a bit into the court case as well. So it's a very messy situation. So the events which would lead up to the decision by the Philippines to bring the South China Sea dispute to the permanent court, you would argue this took place in 2012. A particular incident in the middle of that year, between about April and July, involving a very tense standoff between Chinese um, and Philippine fishing boats and eventually patrol ships. It only ended when um, Chinese ships interdicted the Scarborough Shoal. China has, under the argument that the shoal represented part of uh, China's sovereign waters and that this feature was also uh, considered a Chinese holding. Now, here's the shoal right here. 
Here's the coast of the Philippines right here. You can imagine this was not taken very well by the government in Manila for obvious reasons. This is only, this distance, by the way, is only about 220 kilometers from uh, Luzon Island. The Philippines has claimed that the shoal has been um, Philippine uh, historical territory and represents part of its exclusive economic zone. China, on the other hand, claims the shoal as part of its uh, ancestral holdings. Uh, according to Chinese paperwork, um, this particular shoal uh, under Chinese administration dates back at least as far back as the Yuan Dynasty, so that would be 13th century. Um, and as well, it considers the shoal, which, as you can see, the Chinese name for it is uh, Huang Yuan Dao. The Philippines calls it the Panatag. Uh, despite the fact that this shoal is often submerged uh, in high tide, you can see a picture of it here, not exactly very substantial, according to China, this is an island. And ergo, it does generate a 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone. Ergo, the water surrounding the shoal should also be considered part of sovereign Chinese waters. So a very difficult situation was brewing. After the incident took place, there was a lot of concern that should there be any further confrontation in this area, this would cause a major security problem for not only the two countries, but also for the US. The Philippines has a security treaty with the United States since 1951. And there was a lot of ambiguity over, well, to what degree would the United States get involved should push come to shove. So the US is looking at this with a great deal of nervousness. However, the decision made by the Philippine government under Benigno Aquino to bring this to the court was seen as an attempt to finally bring clarity to what was a very fuzzy situation. You look at maps of the Nine Dash Line. The Nine Dash Line has never been fully clarified. In other words, we don't know exactly for sure which part of the South China Sea is represented. The Nine Dash Line represents between 80 and 90 percent of the sea, depending on your interpretation. So bringing this matter to the permanent court forced a great deal this ambiguity to kind of come to the fore, to actually be defined legally. Now, what else was happening, and this was also prompting the Philippines to get a bit concerned, is that there was also uh, quite a few steps taken by Beijing in recent years to create a much stronger governmental presence in some of the disputed areas. Uh, in July of 2012, for example, the Chinese government announced the creation of a prefecture level, um, excuse me, city at Sancha on Woody Island in the Paracels. So this was seen as another example of China seeking to use law, to use politics, to uh, confirm its own particular presence in the region. Now, the situation got even more complicated just at the beginning of last year. Various reports began to appear in Jane's and then later in the Wall Street Journal, suggesting that China was seeking to augment several of the reefs which it was uh, currently administering. By augmenting, I mean taking sand, bringing it to the reef, and building it up. A reef does not generate much in the way of any kind of economic zones or political rights. But once it becomes an island, then you have the 200 nautical mile rule kicking in. So this was seen as an attempt by China to create, uh, create islands to, and further bolster its own particular claims. Several reefs were in, uh, subject to this kind of augmentation. So Mischief Reef, as I mentioned, uh, Quaritan Reef, Subi up here, and probably the one that was getting the most attention, especially early last year, is the one here, Fiery Cross. Now, I don't know if you can see here, but this uh, line going along the north end, that is a runway. That is a runway which was in the process of being built since last year. It's about three kilometers long. It is capable of servicing heavy aircraft. I haven't seen it uh, up close yet, but... This was definitely seen as a stepping up of the situation. A second airstrip was reportedly under construction at Subi. You can't see too much of it here, but other uh, facilities have been created on some of the other reefs. Now, this activity is not distinct to China. There have been other cases of uh, manipulation of this region by some of the other parties. Case in point, San Ke or the uh, Dao Son Sa by Vietnam. This is an example of a reef which was also augmented. In 1999, just very quickly, 
um, the decision was made by the Philippine government to purposefully uh, run aground a ship, uh, which used to be the USS Hartnett County. Uh, it was later acquired by the Philippines, renamed the Sierra Madre, and it was beached um, in the South China Sea, very close to an islet known as uh, Ayugan, known as the known as well as the Second Thomas Shoal. Um, that's this yellow dot right here. So that was seen as again, an attempt to establish a more permanent uh, presence among some of the disputants in the region. Now, the speed and the volume, though, of China's reclamation um, process really got the attention of a lot of countries, um, Vietnam and the Philippines, but also the United States. The US government began to put out statements saying that what China was doing was basically manipulating the legal structure of the South China Sea. It was trying to create facts on the water, to use a US policy quote or to create a so-called Great Wall of Sand. China's counter-argument, though, is that all of its activities fall completely into its jurisdiction because all of these are taking place within the Nine Dash Line, within Chinese historical waters, and within Chinese holdings. So it was actually China accusing the United States of seeking to upset the apple cart, if you will, by misusing or uh, proposing misleading legal standpoints to deny China access to what it saw as its own territory. At the same time, Beijing argued that this kind of construction was necessary because of the very erratic security situation in the South China Sea, the fact that more and more civilian vessels go through there. All of this was very important for the safety of civilian vessels. So China was seeking to create a better monitoring system and a better surveillance system. Needless to say, this particular explanation did not go down well, either in the Philippines or in the United States. So things have gotten complicated again. Now, since that time, the US was under a great deal of pressure to intervene in some way, without necessarily engaging in direct confrontation. So in October of last year, the United States began so-called Freedom of Navigation Operations, F-O-N-O-P, or FONOPs. Now, these were very close passbys by US Navy vessels and, in some cases, uh, aircraft into some of the disputed islets in order to promote or remind all parties that this is still considered international waters, there is freedom of navigation, and that no party should engage in any kind of interdiction. So the first of these in October of last year, the USS Lassen, operated um, through the Spratly Islands. It passed within 12 nautical miles of Subi Reef. There have been two other phone ops, if you want to call them that, since then. But the last one was back in May, and this was by uh, the destroyer William P. Lawrence. There haven't been any operations since then. There have been no phone ops since this May, and there's been a bit of grumbling in US policy circles that these three phone ops have really not done anything either way to really improve or change the situation. So, and with the election season going on in the United States, one wonders when we'll see any kind of further activity. Although there has been talk that perhaps further phone ops are necessary. One rather tricky question, so again, just to show you some of the um, reefs in question. You have Subi here, you have Fiery Cross. Mischief Reef, again true to its name, has not been subject to any freedom of navigation operations. And there is some debate in the US government as to whether or not this reef should be subject to a phone op in the near future. This would be tricky, though, because this very much operates within Philippine claims. It is still very much within the Nine Dash Line. And any phone op there would definitely be seen by the Chinese government as a stepping up. Each of these operations has been very strongly criticized by the Chinese government as a breach of waters and a breach of sovereignty. And in many cases, some of these operations have been tracked by Chinese vessels. So it's a difficult situation all around. So with all this in mind, we get to, um, we get to the present time, we get to the summer. Huge amount of anticipation was swirling around when the permanent court would actually put down its ruling. Now, it was generally assumed that the ruling would very likely go in favor of the Philippines, at least uh, to a certain degree. And the government of China was anticipating problems because there were many advertisements taken out, many articles were written, and many policy speeches were given by Chinese government members reminding the international community that China's uh, claims to the region were based on historical waters and international law, and that it was the Philippines and the United States that were both acting out of extremely bad faith. 
Oh, this picture here, I don't know if you can see the caption. This is Mischief Reef. So again, a very small uh, reef that is at the center of a great deal of uh, all of these disputes. So the final ruling was given out in July, and it got a lot of attention. Now, the ruling itself is about 500 pages, so I was playing with the idea of reading it, but decided not to. A uh, lot of interesting reading, especially for a non-lawyer like me. But fortunately, they also published a 15-page precy, so that made uh, this job today considerably easier. So the final ruling was by a five-judge tribunal. And even though it was expected that the Philippines would very likely come out as um, the victor, I don't think anyone was predicting that the Philippines would win so much. Pretty much all of the areas of dispute, all of the kind of sections within the ruling favored the Philippines. The primary ruling, I'm not going to read it, um, but this was pretty much the piece de resistance, specifically called into question the validity of the nine-dash line. The primary ruling was that the nine-dash line had no uh, legitimate legal merit and that there was no way that um, or there was no way or no basis, I should say, that the nine-dash line could be used as a basis for historical waters. The response from China, understandably, was extremely negative. That the ruling was without merit, that the ruling, uh, again, represented a breach of jurisdiction, and the government of China, again, called upon the Philippines to begin bilateral talks, and that this particular verdict should be set aside. The ruling also, however, specified the status of several of the reefs which I've been talking about, including some of the ones which have been augmented, including Scarborough Shoal, Mischief Reef, and Fiery Cross Reef. Each of these were designated not as islands, but as rocks, despite the augmentation. They cannot sustain habitation independently, they cannot generate a 200 nautical mile zone, and any attempt at sovereignty or any attempt at claiming them as islands is simply a non-starter. Moreover, Philippine vessels were, according to the ruling, subject to interdiction by Chinese vessels, and there was evidence that some of the island building that was taking place in the South China Sea was also harming the environment. So very, very much a negative um, verdict as far as China was concerned. So Beijing immediately declared this, um, this ruling null and void. It argued that this should not be considered an international issue. And since that time, China has also been very critical of some parties, including the United States and Japan, for openly calling upon China to follow uh, the results of the verdict. Immediately after the verdict was released, and by immediately I mean about 24 hours later, which seemed to suggest that this was being planned uh, well ahead of time, a white paper was released by the Chinese government um, to further clarify the bilateral situation uh, between China and the Philippines. Calling for the bilateral talks, reiterating that, and I'm quoting, China's sovereignty over the Nanhai Zhudao, in other words, the greater uh, uh, South China Sea Islands, and the relevant rights and interests of the South China Sea have been established in the long course of history and are solidly grounded in history and law. This is where kind of the core of the matter comes in. We're dealing with two issues here. First of all, we're dealing with international law. And all parties involved have stressed that international law does apply here. Nobody is doubting that. Although China was very quick to point out that the United States, while having signed on UNCLOS, Law of the Sea, still has yet to ratify it. So China's been very critical of US actions considering this. But the other issue, though, has to do with historical waters, the concept of historical waters, the argument over, OK, which waters could and should be seen as belonging to a particular country based on longstanding historical usage. That is extremely difficult, especially in this case, to prove. Because none of these islets or reefs, or uh, however you want to define them, are permanently inhabited. You have a very long historical period where documentation has been produced, but not enough to really create a definitive example about, OK, what is historical waters and what is the kind of universally agreed view of them. And it's very difficult to set down in law. 
So both of these issues are kind of fighting each other, the, uh, the international legal uh, process as well as the concept of historical waters. And until this gets worked out, we have not really seen the end of this issue, if we're going to be talking about uh, you know, what has been happening since then, uh, since the verdict came out. So China has um, been calling since then for not only the bilateral talks, but also the resumption of talks related to a so-called code of conduct. In other words, can the various parties get together, work out some kind of conduct in order to uh, make sure that there are no further security issues or incidents in the region? And is there a way of kind of setting aside the verdict and moving forward with some kind of further agreements? I should point out, um, getting back to Taiwan, uh, the government of Taiwan also did not really fare well in the ruling. Again, Itu Aba Island, it was also declared a rock by the verdict. So therefore, also incapable of generating a 200 nautical mile zone. The government of um, Tsai Ing-wen has rejected that, arguing that it is very much an island and has also promised to set aside the ruling. So it's not only Beijing that is involved here. So what next? Well, we certainly do have um, some options that are being bandied around. One concern that was raised was that China may, the government of China may move forward and declare a so-called um, ADIZ, an air defense identification zone, similar to what it called or what it designated in 2013 in the East China Sea. There was also a lot of concern that uh, there may be continued attempts at so-called reef or island creating or augmentation, including potentially on Scarborough Shoal, the one very close to the Philippines that would be seen as a very significant change in the situation. That is something which the United States, as well as the Philippines, are quite concerned about. The best scenario at this point, I think, would very likely be some kind of cooling off period, which I think pretty much all of the actors are in favor of. There was a bit of um, <clears throat> concern that uh, Scarborough Shoal near the Philippines would be subject to island augmentation very soon. Conflicting reports have come out over the past week. I'm not sure what the final status of that is. But in order to talk about, OK, what's next, or what do we do going forward, there's some wild cards that we have to keep in mind. First of all, you have the United States. The United States is very much involved in this process, not only due to its treaty obligations with the Philippines, but also its longstanding concerns about the um, freedom of navigation in what is a very important waterway. Problem, though, is we're in the middle of a very bruising election season, as many of you may be familiar with. We have two candidates with, um, shall we say, um, I wouldn't say divergent, but let's just say there have been some differences in ground over how to uh, approach this, how to interpret this, bearing in mind that uh, Hillary Clinton was one of the major architects of the uh, pivot or rebalancing policy. And as for Donald Trump, I'll yeah, just leave that there. So, <clears throat> and of course, you have the US-China relationship, which very much factors into this as well. The second wild card, though, is the government of the Philippines, the new government of uh, President Duterte, whose um, foreign policy dialogue uh, for the past few months has been interesting. <laughs> its relationship vis-a-vis -vis China and the United States is still very much a wild card. Uh, President Duterte has made noises that he is certainly open to the possibility of bilateral talks. His relationship with the US government, again, we can debate this. It has been a bit bumpy of late. So how the Philippines kind of goes forward after the verdict is going to be very key. And third, how will the South China Sea security situation fit in with the larger security concerns in East Asia? So how does this fit in with the East China Sea, which is still very much a great security concern between uh, China, Japan, Taiwan, and the United States? How is this going to fit in with concerns over nuclear security? Uh, North Korea appears to be stepping up its nuclear campaign. There is going to be a lot of debate in the United States, I imagine, over what kind of responses uh, should there be. The recent announcement by um, the Republic of Korea, I should add, about creating um, co-development, I should say, of a terminal high-altitude air defense, or THAAD, has been harshly criticized by China and Russia. So all of these issues are starting to come together. And the South China Sea is just one of the major uh, components that have really um, kind of come together over the past little while. Finally, last point, because it's very difficult to bring this up without bringing in the, uh, the Belt and Road. Um, 
The South China Sea is also going to be quite pivotal to any further development of especially uh, not so much the belts, we can talk about that in questions if you'd like, but the Maritime Silk Road, the blue lines that you see here. Uh, the question of South China Sea sovereignty is going to be crucial to the development of any maritime plans uh, regarding the uh, 21st century Maritime Silk Road, which Beijing wishes to put together. Now, China has stepped up a great deal of maritime activity, not only in the Pacific, but also in the Indian Ocean. Very recently, it was announced, for example, you can't really see it here, in Djibouti, that China would be setting up its first overseas uh, military facilities. This is the first for the Chinese military, in order to monitor China's interests in the Indian Ocean, uh, counter piracy, as well as the number of ships that are expected to make greater use of the waterway in the near future. But put any of this together, put any of this uh, on the table, and you will see that the South China Sea will be very crucial to these developments. So. We have definitely not heard the last of this. So keeping all of this in mind, in conclusion, uh, there's a lot of hope uh, that this autumn will be much quieter in this area after a very, uh, shall we say, turbulent but quite interesting summer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, for that uh, detailed presentation. It's always um, incredible to think that this is just one of the many maritime disputes in, in East Asia. We also have this East Asia, um, East China Sea, which you mentioned briefly, but also, you know, we have Japan's two disputes, one over the Northern Territories with Russia, another over Takashima with South Korea. So maybe we can make a whole new series out of these maritime disputes. I don't know. Uh, I'd now like to open the floor for questions from the audience. If you could please uh, identify yourself and be brief and make sure you ask a question. Comments are fine, but brief and with a question, please. Uh, yes, first in the back, Carl. Uh, thank you, Mark, for a, as normal, very comprehensive and good uh, briefing. Uh, you talked a lot about trade, uh, freedom of navigation, resources, uh, fish, uh, petroleum as arguments and reasons for China's uh, uh, stance in the South China Sea. One thing I, I was missing was the uh, strategic, military st uh, strategic. We know that uh, to this year, China is said to be starting patrolling the Jin class SSBNs. And uh, there are two, two modes operating in SSBN. That's a submarine that carries uh, uh, nuclear missiles. That either as a lone wolf, as the Americans and British do, or in a bastion concept, as the Russians do. Uh, looking at the area of South China Sea and, and the coastal areas that China has uh, access to, most probably because of technical, military, uh, topographic reasons, they will probably operate these submarines in a bastion concept in the South China Sea. Then, I will be, then it's very uh, important to have assets that can protect their own uh, submarines. How important do you see that this argument is for China's stance in this nine dash line? And I haven't read whether the uh, gene has been on patrol yet, but do you know if it's already starting to patrol? And do you know this would be, of course, classified, but do we know where it will operate? Okay, thank you. Um, excellent questions. First of all, I don't believe that actual tests or maneuvers have started yet, although I imagine that this is being um, planned very closely. I do know, and I forgot to mention at the beginning of the lecture, that this week there will be some uh, joint naval operations between China and Russia in the South China Sea, which will very likely get a lot of attention. Now, to your larger question about its military usage, yes, it is extremely important. Um, first of all, if you look at China's uh, policies over the past decade, um, the modernization of the Chinese Navy has been paramount in China's strategic thinking, including the ability to operate further outside of Chinese territory, beyond the so-called first and second island chain. Now, in order to do that, again, it would be necessary for China to develop, which like US military slang calls it a bathtub. So in other words, a bunch of water, which is designated, like this is our water. We can operate here, we can test ships here, and we don't have to worry about an outside uh, an outside actor uh, in the region. So this is why there's been a lot of debate in the United States about anti-access area defense. Because as you say, with China's deployment of boomers, or so-called nuclear submarines, this would certainly augment China's security presence uh, in the South China Sea. 
Now, that said, no actor here involved is actually spoiling for any kind of direct conflict. Like, all sides have definitely taken steps to avoid that. But the problem is, once we see the you know, potential militarization or greater militarization by any party in this, the possibility of some kind of uh, miscommunication, misunderstanding, or just an incident gets that much higher. But absolutely, China does view this as a very important strategic viewpoint, not only for hard military concerns, but also once Chinese ships began making greater use of the Malacca Straits and the Indian Ocean, uh, the concerns about interdiction or the concern about being pushed back by various pivot policies uh, is very key as well. So it's an excellent point. Yes, any more questions from the audience? Yes. Thank you, an excellent presentation, if, if I may say so. Uh, my name is Berg, I'm retired from the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. Uh, first, a, a somewhat uh, historical question, literary, from a literary viewpoint. The summer of our discontent, <laughs> I take this the famous uh, Richard III quote. <laughs> uh, and my slightly altered. Yeah, yes. it's, uh, of course, slightly <laughs> altered. Uh, my question is, is, is there anyone particular playing the role of the son of York you, ha you had in mind, <laughs> or, or, or perhaps not? No, but anyway, uh, back to the main question. It, it, it's, of course, it, it's the bathtub, all, all, different, all kind of different questions. First, on the natural resources. You, you mentioned oil and, and gas. You left out sea, but that was a, a, a fish, fish. Any particular reason for that? Because I thought, I would think that fish is probably one of the most important and, and uh, most com rapidly coming to mind issues. Now, again, on the on, on the on the military questions, uh, particularly as regards the relation between China and the building of the Chinese Navy and, and the U.S. Uh, if you look at the the uh, the European context, there has been a uh, some sometimes when you have the uh, what is it. Uh, a negotiated affair to avoid incidents. Uh, any kind of corresponding uh, agreements between the two parties, you might which might come to mind here, uh, to avoid incidents uh, between, between uh, different uh, issues, uh, ships. And uh, next question is also related to military affairs. And naval military affairs uh, would be. Uh, for the Chinese, is also one of the issues of putting up, uh, let's say, denial of access uh, to prevent the Americans from jo jo coming too close to the China to the China main coast. The main coast. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay thank you. Good questions. Um, in terms of the fishing, yes. I mentioned very briefly, but I can certainly expand, that one of the concerns that was brought forward by Beijing, but this has also been a concern of some of the other parties, is that uh, you have problems of overfishing, you have problems of illegal fishing, and you have the problem of monitoring. Now, one of the points that uh, the government of China has made for the necessity of all of these installations being built is for this kind of monitoring. But absolutely, fishing is a major part of the local economy. It is a huge uh, impact on the economy of all of the various parties involved. And even though it doesn't quite get the same international attention as the oil and gas, it is still something that has to be looked at very carefully. Because without this kind of regulation, and as long as you have all of these kind of overlapping areas of jurisdiction and dispute, the problem of loopholes being created which would allow for illegal or improper fishing practices, it's very serious. Which is one of the reasons why China and several of the other parties, to get to your second question, is, uh, are very keen about setting up some kind of code of conduct, some kind of um, however formal or informal code of conduct similar to what was done back in 2002. In other words, we agree to disagree. We take steps to avoid any kind of civilian traffic being caught up in any kind of dispute. And we try to work forward uh, locally to make sure that some kind of agreement stays in place. In other words, to prevent further escalation of the situation. Now, that has been complicated, according to Beijing, by the inclusion of not only the United States, but also other outside parties. Like Japan, too, has been very vocal about uh, China needing to address the verdict, to abide by the verdict. Beijing's response has been, well, you are a party that is out of this. You really should not be uh, involved or arguing this. Same situation with Australia. So that's a very important point. And yes, area denial is a very important point. Now, this has been a concern um, of the Chinese government back when we had the spy plane incident in 2001, back when uh, then-President Hu Jintao 
began to call for a very serious set of um, uh, maritime security reforms in order to create uh, proper maritime protection. We now have an aircraft carrier. We now have a much more modern Chinese military, but there's still quite a bit to do. Uh, China has milita uh, sorry, I should say uh, China has economic assets that are much further beyond China now, in Africa, in South Asia, in uh, the South Pacific even, that it very much wants to be able to monitor. So the question is, we have this very old, age-old question of defensive versus offensive. How you call it depends on where you sit. We have a question here in the front. And My name is Doug Klost. I'm here in the personal. My name is Doug Klost. I'm here in the personal capacity. Thank you very much for a good uh, briefing. Uh, now my question is short, but maybe uh, comprehensive, uh, because we do see uh, Chinese efforts on very many fields in order, uh, in a, in a way to assert its position uh, in the world coming back to, to a position that China had historically many hundred years ago. Uh, do you th uh, is your assessment that the China and China's government is uh, now shifting to more use of military assets in, in this uh, effort? Or would it, uh, uh, would it continue uh, weighting the economy Excellent question. Um, I guess the short answer would be preferably both, but <laughs> I can certainly expand on that. First of all, yes, China's military, if you look at its spending, if you look at its modernization, has been very significant over the past decade. But uh, as has been pointed out by many specialists, if you look at the official um, spending on the Chinese military just this past year, it sits at about 145 billion American. Compare that to the American military budget, which I think is well north of 600 billion. Uh, still. So that has to be uh, uh, kept in mind. Now, the Chinese government has argued that much of this modernization has been for so-called military operations other than war. China's been very active in peacekeeping. China's been very active in, uh, much more active in humanitarian areas. That said, though, we do see China wanting to develop a stronger military presence in East Asia specifically. And how compatible is that with the U.S. pivot? the concerns of U.S. allies, and the worries that, as we see the Belt and Road, um, the various trade networks develop, how much of that will involve a military component? And what will that do in terms of overall power shifting uh, between the U.S. and China? It's been remarked, including uh, by a previous speaker here, David Shambo, that we're starting to see kind of a split in opinion over how uh, the United States or other countries should respond to this. It used to be that well, we should try to accommodate China. There should be some kind of means of greater cooperation, greater engagement. But now we're starting to see a bit of fragmenting over how the U.S. should respond. So it's a question without a very solid answer, at least not quite yet. Yes, I see three questions. Ike, men over here, and Johan, finally. Um, thank you very much. My name is Eike Roth from the University of Oslo. Um, and I noticed that you talked mainly about the Spratly Islands and, and the, the conflict between China and the Philippines. And I was wondering, um, what about Vietnam and the Parasol Islands in, in, in this context? Um, according to Vietnamese narratives, the Parasol Islands were sort of historically part of the, of the Vietnamese sphere of influence, as, as evidenced by French maps and so on. Um, China uh, kindly offered to take care of them during the American War and then never gave them back uh, with uh, the relationship between China and Vietnam deteriorating and so on. Um, so that's one, one very big issue within Vietnam that receives a lot of media attention there. Another issue uh, is that fishermen have disappeared uh, and their monuments for fishermen who have disappeared and so on, which have caused a lot of anti-China sentiments. So basically my question, basically there are two questions. The first question is, I at the Parasol Islands, do you see something similar happening, China constructing um, buildings or airstrips? I, I remember reading something about tour groups, actually cruise ships going there. So what kind of uh, um, place-making activities are taking place there? And the second question is, I was wondering if you know anything about Vietnam's reaction to the court ruling in The Hague, since they also have their, actually they don't disagree, they would dis probably disagree with the Philippines as well, they have some, some, some competing interests there. So how they reacted to this sort of internationalization of the conflict. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, very good questions. Um, 
Yeah, the status of the paracels have really not changed that much since the 1970s. Uh, they are both, uh, right now they're administered by China. Vietnam claims them as part of their EEZ as well as their historical territory. And I wish I had brought the photo as part of my slides, but if you go to a park in Hanoi, you'll see this giant stone globe with um, Vietnam outlined in red along with the Spratlys and the paracels, both island groups also demarcated in red. So the Spratlys are very much a part of Vietnamese thinking. Now, I mentioned the oil rig incident uh, a short time ago when an oil rig was uh, placed into waters disputed by Vietnam, caused a massive diplomatic stir between the two countries. Once the rig was removed, things began to cool off, but Vietnam is certainly not uh, kind of withdrawn from the situation either. It is a difficult situation, though, because, for example, trade between China and Vietnam is very strong. There's a lot of internal debate within the Vietnamese government over how to address this. And yes, as you said, we go back to the fishing question. If you have uh, conditions where uh, fishing boats or fishing installations are either being removed or unable to operate, this could again be a trigger for uh, further disputes uh, in several areas. Um, the, yeah, okay, so Vietnam's response to the court ruling, very quiet, very quiet. Um, there has been uh, some sign that should a similar incident to the oil rig take place again, let's say we see another oil rig being towed into the disputed zone or if that bilateral situation gets worse. Uh, Vietnam has uh, reserved the right to put forward a similar uh, court challenge. Indonesia, the government of Indonesia has also done that in case things get difficult in the waters around Natuna. But I think now um, Vietnam is wanting to keep things relatively quiet, is understanding that the court case helps its situation somewhat and probably does not want to disturb the situation that much further. Um, even the government of the Philippines, I should add, has been relatively quiet since the uh, ruling was given. There hasn't been any like serious posturing since then. So I think people are just trying to kind of digest the ruling and to try to figure out where to go next. Keeping in mind though that the situation as far as China is concerned is far from over. Yes, gentleman in the second row there. Well, thanks. Um, Aspen Lerbeck is my name. Um, I'm one of those that are fortunate enough not to have an institutional affiliation and only speaks on my own behalf, but have been working in both research institutes and um, NORA and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, one quick comment first about the, um, and you referred to that, Mark, the uh, notion that China has said basically to the US, uh, you better shut up because you haven't ratified uh, the Law of the Sea Convention. I think that is quite a powerful argument. Um, now, second point, um, the relationship between um, uh, the Philippines and the US. Um, you did refer to the, the recent uh, hiccups, the son of a bitch argument between the presidents. Um, is that likely to be just a one-off thing? Uh, or does it go a little bit deeper than that? Um, because the history of relationships between the US and the Philippines is quite a long one and it's a sort of love-hate. Um, the Philippines was conquered by the US, well, it was a colony, uh, it got its liberation, independence, and even in the post-independence periods there have been sort of from confrontation to uh, very good cooperation. Now, the one issue that was mentioned in, in the papers just when um, the ruling in The Hague came, uh, or after the first few days of um, fairly restrained reactions in um, Beijing and uh, Manila, at least when it came to the bilateral relationship. So, so some journalists were saying, hey, there must have been some discussions going on uh, between China and the Philippines preparing for the um, the ruling and what was then coming out of the ruling. Um, now that is obviously an indication of uh, some um, issues where there might have been common understanding between China and the Philippines um, and which may not necessarily play into the hand of, of the United States. So the little bit more longer term perspective on the um, relationship between uh, the Philippines and, and the US would be interesting. Final point, um, the 500 pages text uh, of legal uh, language um, versus the summary. Um, what you had put up on, uh, on, um, on the PowerPoint was an intriguing formulation. Um, 
because it referred to China's position exceeding the geographical and substantive limits of China's jurisdiction under the convention. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean um, the, that the convention being uh, from the 1970s, that uh, the Court of Arbitration may not necessarily want to pose judgments on historical issues that comes before the convention? Uh, I'm not sure if that's the correct interpretation, but is there in the whole text or in the summary actually a more uh, explicit um, judgment on the historical claims? And if not, um, maybe it is uh, that the Court of Arbitration doesn't, doesn't want to go uh, be involved in issues um, that have historical nature before the convention itself came into being. Thank you. Good questions. I'll start with the last one because it is very important and very intricate. Now. What the ruling was designed to do was to specifically designate, first of all, to discuss the issue of the nine dash line within the parameters of UNCLOS. But more to the point, uh, it was there to determine the status of many of these disputed islets, reefs, that according to various parties were either generating or not generating a 200 nautical mile limit. Now, let's say party X were to be ruled that, okay, all of these, um, all these features are islands, they all generate a 200 nautical mile limit, well, that creates a very large space, uh, which would completely upend the specific EZs of each of, the, um, each of the parties. Now, with none of the major reefs under dispute being called islands, they were called rocks, rocks generate nothing in terms of intrinsic value, once you lose that, you pretty much lose a lot of the basis of the nine dash line, according to the Philippine side. Now, what the court cannot do and should not do, and this is the core of China's argument, is that you can't rule on sovereignty, and you cannot rule on historical rights. That is completely outside of the mandate, that completely outside of the jurisdiction. So the major core of China's concern is that what you have done is you have not only ruled on the viability of this islet and that islet, but you've also de facto ruled on sovereignty, ruled on what China sees as historical claims to sovereignty. So it's not necessarily the dates, and Beijing has totally gone out of its way to say that we are still very much uh, in support of UNCLOS. What is the problem is that UNCLOS is, in this case, according to Beijing, being misused, being misused to make a political point, being misused to favor a particular strategic agenda. So that's where the core of the, uh, core of the problem is. Now, the Philippines and China, also a very good question, because uh, looking at some of the statements being made by Beijing up until the ruling, you saw a very subtle kind of change in wording um, when the government of China would come out and say, well, this court process is completely illegitimate. It used to be that China was directly citing the Philippine government as the spoiler. Then the language shifted a bit, saying the Aquino government was the spoiler. The new Duterte government, no mention. And even before the ruling, there was a lot of optimism that perhaps this new government might be more open to the bilateral talks which Beijing has been seeking. So I would not be surprised. There's been plenty of opportunity for in the hallway discussion about what would happen when the uh, verdict came out. And certainly there's a greater possibility now, again, depending on uh, the directions of the Philippine government now, to continue this process. It's going to be very bumpy, though. And the question is, how much a role would the United States play in all this? Because the United States, for now, anyway, is still very much involving itself. And I agree. The fact that um, the U.S. Is not a, uh, has not ratified UNCLOS does create a bit of a uh, kind of an identity issue and certainly provides uh, a forum for concern on China's part. I see another question in the front row. Anyone else while I'm... Hey, uh, my name is Johan. I'm uh, from the LSE. Uh, first, I think when we discuss the South China Sea, it's important also to take a step back and look at the larger picture. Um, I think one of the major concerns for me is that um, if you look at how the, this situation is understood in Beijing, increasingly the actions of the U.S. in particular, but also um, other cu countries, are kind of confirming this perception that uh, a confrontation with the U.S. is inevitable, almost the independent of what China's actions are, right? Uh, so you're starting to see uh, more and more people argue that uh, basically that China needs to prepare. And that's, I have, I've still heard this argument for like why you see the building of, of air, uh, airstrips, for example, is that you need to build up infrastructure. Uh, but my question is, uh, for example, like Yan Shuetong from Tsinghua has recently been arguing that 
China has, because of, of recent actions, have to, they have to, for example, um, go away from the non-alliance policy and start to really seek partners. And they have to stop relying on their economic diplomacy, especially um, in Southeast Asia, uh, no, in the uh, Southern Sea, um, and start to provide um, security um, for um, different countries. Um, and that's the way that they can overcome the, the, cur the coming, basically, confrontation with the U.S. So what's your perception of, of how the South China Sea issue is shaping the debate in Beijing and if China will start to seek uh, stronger uh, and more closer partners in the conflict? Okay, thanks. Excellent questions. Uh, the first point, yeah. Just as uh, debate in the United States over the rise of China has become more fragmented, we're starting to see that a little bit on the Chinese foreign policy side as well. Now, it's a little bit difficult to measure, though. We don't know. We can't really cut it up in terms of percentage, like what percentage sees threat versus opportunity and so forth. But we are certainly seeing worries that, prompted by, perhaps prompted by the pivot or prompted by concerns over the longer-term trajectory of U.S. policy in East Asia. Japan, if I had more time, I would argue this as well, is very much a wild card in this process. Like, what will the U.S.-Japan look like, if at all, let's say, in the next uh, 20, 30 years? How is that going to work? Um, all of these are now having to be calculated because now China is entering into a very difficult um, phase of its great power growth. It is now starting to expand its interests. It's now starting to develop partnerships and economic commitments well beyond China um, in many parts of the world, areas that will need uh, greater monitoring and greater protection in some cases. So as China begins the debate about you know, how much uh, should the military get involved in these processes, we are starting to see differences of opinion come out, including some of the recent works by uh, Yan, Yan Zhetong. Now, on the issue of partnership, now, again, this is where things get a bit tricky, because to set up alliances, as far as traditional Chinese thinking is concerned, that is a commitment which I don't believe is the direction that Beijing really wants to go in, at least now. Because... Once you start setting up alliances, you're basically putting yourself into a very significant uh, potential balance of power situation. So you'll notice that, again, in South China Sea dialogue, China points to partners, saying that, oh, country X agrees with our view on the South China Sea, and that we want to set up partnerships with you know, many countries outside of East Asia. Don't think we are going to be seeing in the short term any serious movement beyond that. Um, with the Belt and Road, that will involve the economies of several countries. And yes, there will be some military components, like what will happen, for example, the recent agreement with Myanmar, I mentioned Djibouti, um, possibly some other countries along the various routes, will get involved in a military fashion. But to go a step further and call them alliances, I don't think that is really on China's short-term agenda, because that really uh, changes the game in terms of how its power balancing with the United States is going to go. Another question in the back. Yes, I forgot to introduce myself last time. Harald Hovall is my name. I'm a military analyst with the Center of International Strategic Analysis. I have one question at the, at the end here uh, about the larger picture, uh, because I've just moved to New Delhi. We lived there two, for two years. So I'm interested in India's position here. Uh, more concretely, I remember that on the position of EEZ, interpretation of the EEZ, India shared China's interpretation of very strict uh, interpretation of the freedom of navigation. Do you know how, what is India's uh, reaction to the, uh, the verdict in, in, in The Hague? Uh, are they still, uh, are their position the same as the Chinese after the verdict? Uh, that is an excellent question. I have not heard any very specific uh, statements by the government of India on the verdict, certainly compared to some of the other major players like uh, Japan and Australia. Now, certainly India, on one hand, is very much a player in this scenario because one of the reasons behind the whole uh, issue of jurisdiction of the South China Sea is that it is a major outlet through the Malacca Straits into the Indian Ocean. Now, on one hand, certainly India would greatly welcome increased trade in the Indian Ocean, but then you get, again, the military aspects. You get China potentially setting up um, strategic agreements with some of the major players uh, in the Indian Ocean. There was a lot of discussion, for example, some time ago about a potential depot in the Seychelles. That didn't go anywhere, but it certainly got India's attention. You have Sri Lanka, you have Myanmar. So on one hand, India is very concerned about the international legal aspects of the ruling. But at the same time, it knows that China very much wants to be a player in India's backyard. So 
the policy debate, I imagine, going beyond closed doors is probably very extensive right now. But that is something I should look at, absolutely. Yeah. And another question here from Ian. So, yeah, Ian Bowers, I'm an associate professor at the Norwegian Institute for Defense Studies. I have maybe two and a half questions for you. Uh, the first one is, I think you are underestimating the role of fishing okay. in the South China Sea. The Spratlys is one element, but for most of the states in the region, the main problem they have with China is, is fishing. And even if you extend into Northeast Asia, South Korea, and I was hoping you can talk a bit more about the hybridization of the Chinese fishing fleets, and particularly the Chinese government supplying uh, steel hulled vessels, uh, military training for, fishing, uh, for fishermen, and uh, the kind of uh, funding of maritime militias or civilian maritime militias, which is, uh, which is very interesting. So you have the Chinese Navy not really being involved, but certainly uh, very well prepared and well trained uh, fishing vessels operating around Indonesia. They were the vessels that were zipping around the Lassen when it was doing its uh, freedom of navigation. And I think it's a, it's a really interesting point. The second point is on the, the islands. Uh, it was my understanding that the Chinese never, and correct me if I'm wrong, but they never um, tried to use the expanded islands or the built upon islands to um, to claim an EEZ off, um, because they already acknowledged under UNCLOS that artificial structures cannot generate EEZs, from my understanding. And really, uh, these um, artificial reefs and ports and, and other facilities are there to mitigate China's own strategic weaknesses. You would never see the United States building one of these, because they don't need to, because they have very large aircraft carriers. Uh, so I, I just wonder if you could comment a bit more on that. And then finally, on the point of India and other countries who are worried about freedom of navigation, I think it's important to separate freedom of navigation for military ships and freedom of navigation for civilian shipping. And often that the distinction is lost in the debate here. And we see it lost a lot in the Indian debates. Um, they talk about we need to secure the freedom of navigation for our sh civilian ships. But the reality is I think 70% of them go to China. So how do, you, how do these countries reconcile competing with China over freedom of navigation, but the reality is most of their trade happens with China. All right, okay. Okay, you're making my afternoon interesting, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, first question regarding fishing. Yes, I do agree this is probably an area which tends to get uh, downplayed quite a bit by studies in the media. Again, it doesn't quite have the same kind of shock factor as let's say the oil and gas, but it is very important when you look at uh, the potential strategies that China is moving forward. now. You mentioned the steel hull, otherwise known as a white hull strategy. So what has happened, first of all, uh, you have various kind of Coast Guard elements being brought together into a single Coast Guard. But as you correctly point out, several fishing vessels have also been added to the mix. Some of them have been involved in some of the various uh, encounters, some of the various um, uh, potential interdictions of phone offs, absolutely. Uh, this is what I meant, I didn't have a chance to go into it extensively about the so-called cabbage strategy that is being discussed that you have military vessels being involved, but you also have Coast Guard and fishing vessels creating various layers of monitoring, protection, legitimacy, however you want to call it, being involved in this process. And this is why when the Philippines brought forward the court case, one of the major issues they were concerned about is what is this doing to our own fishing vessels? They're being chased out, they're not being allowed in, they're not being allowed to do this and that, and that's not fair because we're talking about a Philippine EEZ. So yes, absolutely, you do need to uh, discuss that part at length as well. Now, the artificial structures, I don't believe that any uh, Chinese policymakers come out and specifically said, well, this particular augmented feature automatically creates an EZ. But if you're talking about the legitimacy of the nine dash line and the legitimacy of Chinese activities, I believe it is implied. And I believe this is what um, the Philippines was very concerned about, that as long as this activity keeps up, uh, the so-called facts of the water on the water were being created. And the concern that the Philippines and the United States has is that now you have um, very significant facilities, Woody Island and the Paracels. You have various facilities being created on Fiery Cross. If something were to be built at Scarborough Shoal, the one very close to the Philippines, this would be called the so-called Iron Triangle. It would create a very large area of potential monitoring on China's part, making it very difficult for uh, other ships to operate there. As for freedom of navigation, yes. I mean, this has been something which has been criticized quite a bit, that the United States, for example, has been acting to secure overall 
freedom of navigation for civilian vessels. I stress again, no party has saying that civilian vessels should be denied access to the South China Sea. Nobody is calling for interdiction. The serious issue is about military operation, which is why these freedom of navigation operations have used American uh, military vessels and have been used to very basically make a point that you know, we do have the right to sail through these waters, innocent passage, and so forth. So many, many layers involved here. Very good point. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from the room? No. OK. Well, then, on that note, I think we'll conclude today's seminar. Please join me in giving a round of applause to Mark. Uh, and again, I'd like to remind you about the upcoming seminar next Tuesday. You can find more information, including registration, on Nupi's webpage. Uh, it's in Norwegian right now, but it will also, also be partially held in English since we'll have colleagues from Finland and Denmark. Uh, and uh, please also look at the next um, issue of International Politik with its focus on Asia. Uh, and we will be having more and more seminars in out October, November, so please just keep checking and join us for those. Thank you for coming today. Thank you, everybody.